Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Efron. Welcome. Uh, I'm the director of the Magnus Collection and director of the Center for Jewish Studies here at Berkeley. And uh, we are delighted to have you with us today. Uh, just to let you know that this event is being recorded. And for those who are not able to see all of it in, in one hit today, it will, it's recorded and will be available for later viewing on our YouTube channel. Uh, as I said, we're delighted to have you here, if, even only from afar. We wish we could have gone ahead with the event as we had planned, and uh, but to, uh, COVID determined uh, otherwise. So anyway, uh, we're here and it will be a wonderful event, I have no doubt about that. Um, the symposium is also acting as this year's Center for Jewish Studies annual Dilla lecture, and I wish to thank the Dilla family for its steadfast support of the Center for Jewish Studies. Roman Vishniak was one of the most renowned and celebrated modernist photographers of the 20th century, though his interests were highly varied and his subject matter diverse. He is best known today for his intensely intimate photographs of Jews in interwar Eastern Europe. Some of these were first published in 1947, but it was his 1983 book, A Vanished World, that ensured his global reputation. When Vishniak traveled around Eastern Europe between 1935 and 1938, photographing Jews at the behest of the Joint Distribution Commu Committee, that world had, of course, not yet disappeared. Eastern Europe was still home to millions of Jews and was the heartland of European Jewry as a whole. By 1945, European Jewry had been decimated and thus Vishniak's photographs, though little did he know it when he took them, would prove to be one of the final visual mementos of a now lost civilization. It is not lost on us that many of those photos were taken in what is today Ukraine or in places such as Warsaw, which are now safe havens for fleeing Ukrainians. With the current devastation, we are again confronted with profound loss in that part of Europe most of us reduced to observers of a world that and way of life that is disappearing, if not forever, then at least for a very long time. Devastation, as we all know, is not without precedent in Ukrainian Jewish history. A century ago, the pogroms of 1918 to 1921 claimed the lives of as many as 100,000 Jews. That orgy of death and destruction was memorialized in a number of ways poetry among them. In 1921, the great expressionist Yiddish poet Peretz Markish wrote a poem about the pogroms in a poema, a long narrative poem entitled Die Kuppe, which means the heap. He exclaims in the opening stanza, Noch eich herogen von Ukraine, wie viel mit eich die Erd ist, und euch eich geschichtene in Kuppe, in Horeditsche der Stuart beim Dnieper, Kaddish. To you, the murdered of Ukraine, how full the earth is with your remains, and also you, the butchered in a heap in the town of Horodice at the Dnieper, Kaddish. It's a lament for the hopelessness and helplessness of Ukraine's Jews. There would be no rescue, and in fact, no meaning to be read into the way they perished. All that was left to do, even for the Marxist, Markish, and perhaps he just meant it ironically, was to say Kaddish. Let's hope that the world can do better this time. Around that very time, 1920 to be precise, Vishniak, who was from Russia, joined his family in Berlin and lived there for the next 19 years. To a post-war generation in, Ger in Weimar, Germany, a bubbling cauldron of cultural experimentation, photography was heralded as a medium that seemed capable of representing honesty and unambiguous reality. Since truth, as the old adage goes, is the first casualty of war, then the documentary power of photography stood to offer the unvarnished truth, as opposed to language, which had been used and abused in the service of wartime propaganda. There were, of course, stern critics of photography, such as Bertolt Brecht, and the one, a one-time champion of the practice, and Siegfried Krakauer, but they were unable to effect a revolution against photography. It was here to stay. And Vishniak's use of the camera to humanize a seemingly inhuman world was a powerful rejoinder to the critics of photography. Vishniak's deep and abiding humanism, no less than the searing truth of Markish's poetry, 
shines forth not only in his justly famous photographs of impoverished and deeply religious Jews, but in his science photography, of which he was a pioneer, and his nature photography, particularly his stunning photographs of animals. He was especially fond of storks, so I've come to learn they are noteworthy gems in the archive. Vishniak's life spanned the bulk of the 20th century, a period of unbounded Jewish suffering and triumph. He lived it and photographed much of it. In 2018, Mara Vishniak Cohen donated the life work of her father to the Magnus Collection at UC Berkeley, which is now tasked with preserving that which he preserved, namely precious images of a vanished world. As part of the UC Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, the Vishniak archive is also a major research and teaching resource. The archive contains some, some 35,000 items, among them are 7,000 photographic prints, over 11,000 negatives, some 1,500 items categorized as ephemera, which include awards, date books, diaries, documents, correspondence, and papers. It is the single largest gift of art that Magnus has ever received, and it is the third largest gifted collection ever received by UC Berkeley. I wish to recognize the extraordinary generosity of our donors to both the Magnus and the Center for Jewish Studies for making this event and indeed everything we do possible. For the symposium specifically, I'd also like to thank UC Berkeley Office of UDAR, that is the University Development and Alumni Relations and its Director of External Relations, Carlin Silwick, and Julie Oliver from the Office of the, De of the Dean of Arts and Humanities. They've worked intensively with Magnus and CJS staff to make our to the event possible. In addition, I want to express my deep gratitude to Laura Bratt, Marketing and Co Communications Co Coordinator of the Magnus, Etta Haber, Executive Director of the Center for Jewish Studies, Jennifer Lipscomb, Program Coordinator of the Center for Jewish Studies, and uh, the inestimable Marjorie uh, Lightman, and Deborah Banks, before she left UCB, uh, all of those together work together tirelessly on the logistics and publicity and much else besides to help make today's event a reality. Finally, I wish to thank our new Dean of Arts and Humanities, Sarah Geyer, for her consistent and unwavering support of the Magnus and the Center for Jewish Studies. And similarly, my thanks go to Ca Chancellor Carol Christ for her robust backing and support of Jewish studies and Jewish life more generally on the Berkeley campus. Thank you to both of you. And now with that said, the, we'll begin the learning about Vishniak. Uh, and that's the reason we're here today. But before that, I just want to turn the, uh, the Zoom over, I guess, not the mic, but the Zoom uh, over to Dean Sarah Guy to say a few, a few well, words of welcome. So Sarah. Thank you, John, and thanks to all of you for, for being here. Uh, um, first of all, that long and um, beautiful list of thanks uh, um, has only one real absence, and that's our thanks to you, John, for serving in dual roles as director of the Center for Jewish Studies and also as the interim faculty director for the Magnus. In these roles, you've done a tremendous amount in really every sector, intellectual and academic, community building, and also um, development for, uh, for Magnus and for CJS, so, so thank you. Uh, um, I had a chance to see many of you who I see are joining us today, yesterday. Um, others of you I've had the chance to meet, and others I look forward to meeting, um, whether uh, virtually or, or on campus. As many of you know, I just arrived to UC Berkeley or arrived for the second time. I was a graduate student here many years ago, but just arrived this past September. And one of the things that I've been most delighted to be able to support and one of the sites of ongoing collaboration since I think John, even before I arrived to campus has been uh, really um, thinking about the ways in which this moment is the moment for, for Magnus. And that is indissociable from the arrival of this extraordinary collection um, to Magnus, but also its arrival to Magnus at and as part of UC Berkeley. What we'll experience today is really the fruits of that collaboration and what I see the possibility of that collaboration, which is, an event, a symposium that is so deeply intellectual and academic in its focus, and at the same time, so open and available to a broad public, both within the Bay Area and uh, nationally and internationally. 
I hope and I am, I am certain that this is the first of many such uh, collaborations around the Vishniat collection, particularly as we see it um, getting digitized and re-digitized, uh, um, read and re-read by scholars and students across campus and also um, those of you who are joining us today uh, from other parts of the country and the world. So with that, I want to invite you all um, to continue to think together. And I wanna thank you all for being part of the Magnus and for your support, both scholarly, intellectual, and also uh, communal and, um, and general. I look forward to hearing what the rest of the day holds. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we have, during the breaks today, you're going to see a, an installation that was uh, just put up, uh, well, I think it's on Friday and was shown for the first time to an open house uh, at, at the Magnus uh, of uh, sort of a broad variety and palette of uh, Vishniak's work. Um, that we're able to see that uh, is due in large part to the, uh, the work of our head curator, uh, Francesco Spagnolo, who it is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you. Uh, he's designed this display that you'll be able to see, as I say, during the breaks throughout the course of the day. And uh, he is here to explain what it is that you, you are going to see and also discuss the, you know, the scholarly potential of the archive and just what it means uh, to have it here at the Magnus. So, I turn it over to Francesco. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sarah, for these introductory words. And uh, as, as you can imagine, it's it's an honor and an incredible task to to care for the Roman Vishniak archive, beginning with bringing it to Berkeley. And uh, we're talking about over thirty thousand images. And uh, uh, today we're focusing very much on on uh, on Vishniak's works in Central Eastern Europe in the interwar period but the archive contains a lot more. So what we're sharing today are the first images that were seen in America after Vizniak arrived uh, from Europe in 1940. They were displayed at the Yibo Institute for Jewish Research in New York City. And we've photographed the original display. So these were um, black and white photographs pasted on cardboard supports, backing, and described in, by hand. So that's how captions were done in museum, in a museum exhibition at the time. That, so described by hand with captions in Yiddish and English that uh, tell us about places, dates, and uh, small descriptions of the images. And these are kind of the earliest sources of what we understand uh, of Vishniak's work in Eastern Europe. But of course, the archive also contains tens of thousands between negatives and contact prints. And through those, just to stay with the, with the East European materials, uh, through those, we understand when Vishniak photographs using a Leica, a camera that allows to, to, uh, to, to shoot quickly and, and to capture things in the moment, or a Rolleiflex, a camera that requires longer exposure and more framing work and more, more attention to, to how to compose the, the frame. Through that, we're really starting to understand the work that Vishniak did day in, day out in documenting Central and Eastern Europe uh, at that time, but uh, the archive has a lot more. First of all, a whole exhibition history, basically. So we, we, can, we can look back at how Vishnik's work has been presented and received over the decades. He lived a very, very long life. He died in 1990. And uh, especially exhibitions leading up to the publication in 1982-83 of, of A Vanished World, the book that really, then in translations and other languages, really made his uh, name known on a global on a global scale. And of course, the archive has a lot more. The minute Roman Vishniak arrives to New York, he starts documenting New York City, both Jewish institutions, but also, for example, um, a lot of other marginal uh, communities, uh, Chinatown, uh, Harlem, uh, nightclubs. Um, a, a lot of this is, is documented in the archive, and so is the photographic work that, and you mentioned this earlier, John, that Roman Vishniak did his entire life, nonstop, which was photographing the biological world, animals from, from, from uh, animals in the Berlin Zoo uh, to um, uh, microscopic uh, photography that he pioneered, uh, contributing to, to films, to, to, to scientific articles uh, throughout his entire career. So we also have a selection 
of those. And as you can imagine, listening to us from home, uh, the diversity of the archive, the fact that it contains very, very crucial material documenting Jewish life in Europe, but also other material uh, beyond make it a perfect match also for how the Magnus was uh, was uh, included into UC Berkeley for the Magnus to speak to a variety of departments. And uh, so we already had undergraduate graduate students from various departments, including history of science, uh, come and work uh, with the archive as we document it painstakingly moving forward. And we hope to make it digitally accessible uh, to everyone before long. Um, so today will be accompanied by sampling of uh, images from the archive, both the earliest and the scientific materials that really pinpoint uh, Vizhniak's life and production as a photographer. Thank you, Francesca. And uh, so now we can turn um, to uh, the reason that we're here and uh, begin begin our symposium. Um, I can just tell you that you are more than welcome to submit any questions that you have um, to our speakers throughout the course of the day. Uh, put them into the Q&A at the bottom of your, your Zoom screens, and uh, then we will, um, we will pose them to, to our speakers. So um, our, first, our first panel uh, is entitled Vishniak's Workshop, the Polish Republic and Weimar Germany. And uh, like any master craftsman, uh, Vishniak also had a workshop. It just happened to be, you know, basically most of Central and Eastern Europe in the interwar period. Um, and the backdrop of, uh, the backdrop of, uh, of that work uh, both physically and also culturally, uh, you know, went to inform these stunning photos that we've now come to know so well. Um, our first speaker today uh, is uh, Samuel Kassoff. Um, Sam is the Charles Northrum Professor of History at uh, Trinity College, uh, holds, holds a PhD from, uh, in history from uh, Princeton. Um, he is a uh, has been a, a visiting professor all over the world at places like Harvard and Toronto and Dartmouth and is a fellow of the American Academy of Jewish Research. And um, from 2006 until 2013, he was the lead historian for two galleries in the Polin Museum. For anyone who has not been to the Polin Museum in Warsaw, just as soon as it's uh, safe and convenient and, and you're able to go, I recommend it highly, to the Poland Museum of the History of the Polish Jews in Warsaw, which opened in 2014. And Sam is greatly responsible for, for much of what one would see there. Uh, he's the author of a number of books uh, in Jewish and in Russian history, uh, including his classic, uh, Who Will Write Our History, Emanuel Ringelblum and the Secret Ghetto Archive, which received the Orbis Prize from the AAAS Association, which was a finalist for the Jewish National Book Award. It's been translated into eight languages. Most recently, together with um, David Roski's, uh, Sam produced the ninth volume of the Posen Anthology of Jewish Culture, which was published by Yale University Press in 2019. And he's just completed an annotated translation of the Warsaw Ghetto Memoirs of Rachel Auerbach, and is part of a team of historians writing a history of the Holocaust in Poland for Yad Vashem. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sam Kassoff now, who will speak to us about the Polish Republic in the interwar period. Sam. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks, uh, John, for inviting me to speak at this uh, wonderful symposium. Uh, it's quite a challenge to summarize interwar East European Jewry in 30 minutes. And so I'll concentrate on the largest community, Poland, with its three and a half million Jews and to a smaller extent on Subcarpathia and Czechoslovakia, two places where Vishniak took most of his pictures during his journeys to Eastern Europe on a JDC commission between 1935 and 1938. The interwar years saw many key changes in Jewish Eastern Europe, changes that were both positive and negative. On the positive side, new and innovative schooling for both boys and girls, a flourishing Jewish press, theater, and literature, uh, the transformation of Jewish self-help, the professionalization of social welfare activity, the ongoing transition 
from traditional charity to more modern forms of healthcare. There's vocational training, the growth of microcredit. These years saw a strengthening of the ties between Jews in Eastern Europe and the Jewish diaspora with the work of the Joint Distribution Committee, a case in point. It would also, there was a new source of hope and inspiration, the Yeshuv in Palestine. But there were also changes for the worse. The new nation states that succeeded the collapsed Tsarist and Habsburg empires, despite formal guarantees of equality, favored the political and economic interests of the dominant nationality at the expense of minorities. The entire region suffered from economic stagnation, even before the onset of the Great Depression in 1929, a stagnation caused by the collapse of traditional markets, new political boundaries that stifled trade, as well as a secular decline in agricultural and commodity prices. This at countries like Poland especially hard, and it made the position of the Jewish minority all the more precarious. East European Jewry also suffered from new immigration restrictions, such as the 1924 Johnson-Reed Act in the United States. For various reasons, the one successor state, which quote unquote was good for the Jews, was Czechoslovakia. Thanks to the political leadership of Thomas Masaryk, political anti-Semitism remained muted until the aftermath of the Munich crisis in late 1938. Economic conditions were better there, especially in the Czech lands, where most of the Jews were solidly middle class. In Slovak regions, however, Jews were not as secure. They were threatened by a Slovak nationalist movement that was markedly anti-Semitic and that came to power when the Czech state collapsed in 1939. The extreme east of the country, the Subcarpathian region, where Vishnia took many of his pictures, was Czechoslovakia's Appalachia, mired in deep poverty, exacerbated by a loss of traditional markets in Hungary, by poor communications with richer parts of the country, and by a reliance on agriculture and lumbering that offered a marginal existence at best. This beautiful land, a Hasidic stronghold, had an exceptionally high number of Jewish peasants and Jewish lumberjacks, manual workers, all photographed by Vishniak, along with yeshiva students, poor religious shopkeepers, and peddlers. On the other hand, if one relied just on Vishniak's photographs, one might get a somewhat skewed picture of Jewish life there. In the two major urban centers, Munkach and Ushgara, there was a Jewish middle class of sorts, and many still spoke Hungarian, a reminder of the pre-World War I Hungarian Jewish symbiosis that had by now vanished for good. Zionism and Zionist youth movements began to challenge Hasidic hegemony. In the 1920s, an important Zionist political figure and educator, Chaim Kugel, settled in Munkach, where he established, much to the chagrin of the Munkach Rebbe Chaim Eliezer Shapira, Czechoslovakia's only Hebrew language high school. He also was elected to the Czech parliament in 1935. Vishniak was documenting the end of an era, just as he was leaving, Czechoslovakia collapsed and Hungary took over the region, introducing anti-Jewish legislation. I'd now like to segue to Poland, Europe's largest Jewish community and the second largest in the world. <clears throat> and this is where Bishniak spent much of his time. A cursory glance at the titles of some of the most important books on interwar Polish Jewry, Celia Stupnitska Heller's On the Edge of Destruction, Emanuel Meltzer's No Way Out, Jankiew Leszczynski's Achtenrand von Obgrund, On the Edge of the Abyss. Well, these titles hardly convey a message of triumphalist optimism about the state of Polish Jewry. In more recent research, just as Ken Moss's important study and unchosen people, Jewish political reckoning in pre-war Poland carries much the same message. The reckoning that Moss refers to was, if we can, let's get the hell out of here. The years 1935 to 1939 
between the death of strongman Josef Pilsudski and the German invasion of Poland, the time that the JDC sent Wisniak to Poland, marked a, a nadir in Polish-Jewish relations. There was growing anti-Jewish violence in market squares and in the universities, a state-backed campaign to force Jews to leave the country through economic boycotts, targeted taxation, and job discrimination. And let me do a share screen here. And uh, here is a picture of one of many pogroms. This is a pogrom in Minsk, Mazowiecki. This broke out uh, in Minsk, Mazowiecki in June 1936. I.J. Singer finished his epic novel, The Brothers Ashkenazi in the mid-1930s, by having his lodge Jews exclaim, everything we built, we built on sand. In 1936, after the pogrom in Pshitik, which would be followed by other pogroms, the beloved Yiddish songwriter Mordechai Gebirtik wrote his well-known Esprent, Our Town is Burning, which many observers mistakenly believed was written during the Holocaust. In hindsight, the lyrics seem tragically prophetic. The moment is at hand when, God forbid, our town, along with all of us, will be turned to ashes by the flames. Only bare black walls would remain as after a battle. Our town is burning, and only you can save it. Extinguish the fire with your very blood if you must. Don't just stand there, brothers, with folded arms. Nemti kalim leshta fire, babaista zirdos kent unerstet und kukta zezech mit verlegte hand. And it goes on and on. But in fact, ashes and flames were symbols of economic ruin, not literal destruction. In their worst nightmares, neither Gebirtik nor I.J. Singer foresaw Treblinka or Belzec. Hard as it is not to do so, let's try not to uh, look at Vishniev's photographs through the retrospective prism of the Holocaust. Gebirtig actually wrote as Brent in response to the 1936 Pshitik pogrom. He wanted to rouse Polish Jewry to fight back against an escalating campaign to stampede them out of the country. And this was exactly what the Joint Distribution Committee was doing when it sent Vishniak to Poland. That it paid him so handsomely, $15,000 in all, according to Maya Benton, shows just how important they thought his mission was. Given the grim background that I've just cited, can there still be room for more nuanced interpretations that are not all gloom and doom? Yes, I think so. In the mid-1980s, the late Ezra Mendelssohn wrote a landmark article with the revealing title, Interwar Poland, Good for the Jews, Bad for the Jews. And his answer, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. As Mendelssohn explained, best and worst were dialectically linked. Precisely because Polish Jewry, faced with institutionalized discrimination, lacked the same opportunities for educational and economic mobility enjoyed by American Jewry or even Soviet Jewry, it was forced to rely on itself. And in the process, it had to nurture and develop its own cultural resources and its considerable talent for self-help. There was indeed no doubt that the national consciousness and energy of pre-war Polish Jewry gave it an unrivaled place in the Jewish world. In 1933, one of the great leaders of the Polish Jews, Rabbi and Senator Osia Ston of Krakow, wrote that Polish Jewry, for all its troubles, had a mission which it could not shirk to serve as the vanguard of the Jewish people. Only Polish Jewry possessed the national consciousness and Jewish cultural capital that Soviet and American Jewry lacked. And while there's no denying the impoverishment of many Polish Jews, we should also remember Joseph Marcus's important caveat that you're more likely to be poor if you live in a poor country. And poor Jews, Marcus argued, were still better off than the majority of Polish peasants 
whose per capita income and purchasing power was lower in 1938 than in 1913. Vishniak's job was to help the JDC raise money, not to document the diversity of Polish Jewry. Uh, <clears throat> and these three and a half million Polish Jews lived in big cities and small towns. They were religious and secular, Yiddish speaking and Polar speaking, yeshiva students and young Kalutzim, pioneers, Bundes marching in May Day parades and communists languishing in Polish jails, Jews in small towns sending snippets of local folklore to the Yivo in Vilna, a Yiddish theater in Warsaw, staging a play about the Scottsboro boys in Alabama. In big cities and in small towns, Jews struggled to make a living, but they also had a life. One popular song has a Jewish young woman threatening her religious boyfriend. Unless he learns to dance the Charleston, he'd better find himself another girl. Tango un Charleston. I don't care if you're in the Aguda or in the Bund, the day will come when even the religious Jews are going to be dancing the tango and the Charleston. Polish popular music and cabaret were full of Jewish uh, 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 performers. And uh, here I, I want to show you a picture of Poland's leading jazz band in those years, the Gold. Uh, Peterburski band. Movies were popular. Uh, ads from a movie house in Nagrobok near where we lived invited all and sundry to see King Kong in Yiddish, Kum Zet Atzvansik Metodige Malpe. On Saturday nights in my grandparents' restaurants in a tiny shtetl nearby, they moved the chairs and showed films. And my mother remembered that in the summer of 1939, they were waiting for copies of Avek Mitten Wind, the Gone with the Wind, and of Kishif Macher von Oz, the Wizard of Oz. Uh, the American craze for beauty contests made it across the ocean uh, to uh, Poland. And uh, here I uh, want to show you uh, a picture from uh, a Polish Jewish magazine featuring uh, Miss Judea. Uh, and uh, this was a different era, of course, but the caption is the most beautiful Jewish woman in Poland. Uh, in uh, a little shtetl newspaper, uh, we see a beauty contest, Miss Glubok wearing a sash in Yiddish, Miss Glubok, and my late uncle told me the backstory. Uh, each youth movement had its candidate. Betar, the right-wingers were furious because their entry lost to the girl from Hashomer. The Betarnik said that the uh, Hashomernik was as ugly as sin, and she won only because of political correctness, and that led to a fist fight. Uh, Hiking was popular, skiing was popular, kayaking, often in trips sponsored by a society called the Society for Lankentenish, asked telling Jews to hike, to ski, to uh, kayak along the Polish rivers, to give yourself, to remind yourself that you're, you've been in Poland as long as the Poles and the land belongs to you as well as them. And this is a picture of the kayaking issue of the Lankentenish magazine. Polish Jews wrote, rooted for their favorite soccer team. They read the latest French and American novels. Many young people rejected the world of their parents and found a substitute family and a new home in youth movements that challenged age-old age traditions, preached new values, and offered hope for a better future. And yes, despite the growing secularization in interwar Poland, hundreds of thousands of Jews still sought guidance and comfort from the great religious leaders of interwar Poland, or drop by and shul after a hard day's work to study a page of Mishnes or Ein Yankiv. 
The economic structure of Polish Jewry was quite different from that of the uh, Poles. Uh, while Poles were mostly rural peasants, Jews in shtetls and cities were merchants, small shopkeepers, petty artisans, and, and uh, uh, toiled in smaller factories. About half of Poland's doctors and lawyers were Jewish, but many had to struggle. The Jewish workers almost invariably worked in very small workshops where wages were much lower than large factories and where they were not protected by unemployment benefits and social welfare legislation. Polish Jewry in those years, in the Second Polish Republic, was a work in progress, bringing together Jewish tribes with different historical and cultural traditions the Galicianers from the Austrian partition, the Jews of Congress Poland, the Litvaks from the Russian Pale of Settlement, slowly forged a common identity as Polish Jews, thanks in large part to the impact of the big cities. On the eve of the war, about a quarter of all Polish Jews lived in the five largest cities, Warsaw, Lwów, Krakow, Lodz, and Vilna. And I want to show you uh, a picture of a courtyard in uh, Jewish uh, Warsaw on uh, Nalewki, where as many Jews would live in one of these courtyards with stores on the bottom and uh, tenements going up five or six floors, as many Jews might live here as Jews in an entire uh, shtetl. These new cities became the center of political life, welfare organizations, theater, uh, and the Yiddish press. And just as the new capital, Warsaw, brought together previously divided Poles, so too did it help Poles integrate themselves and find a shared identity. But not all Polish Jews lived in big cities. In 1939, about half of Polish Jewry still lived in small uh, uh, towns, shtetlach in Yiddish, miasteczki in Polish, with the remaining 25% in mid-sized provincial cities. Outside the big cities, the pace of life was slower, the hold of tradition and religion stronger. Jews in small towns were less likely to speak Polish as their uh, first language. In hundreds of such small towns, Jews and Poles met at the weekly market day. And here we see the weekly market in Kolbushova, uh, where Jews and Poles knew each other, where they established personal relationships as familiar strangers. These relationships were marked by cultural difference, easygoing neighborliness, but also by a certain degree of mutual suspicion. Polish Jews waged a tough battle in parliament and city councils, in the press, and even in the streets to defend their rights. There were three major Jewish political currents, Zionism, the religious Aguda, and the socialist Bund. In addition, there were also the focus, the populace, and the remnants of the old assimilationist movement. Communism certainly attracted a number of Jews. Many communists were Jews, but very few Jews were communists. Jewish political parties had no hope of entering the government or sharing power, yet the very fight to defend Jewish rights helped to boost Jewish morale, and Jewish voting participation was high. And if Jewish political parties won few victories in parliament, they nonetheless accomplished a great deal on the Jewish street itself. Their biggest success was in the total way of life they offered their followers, schools, camps, sports, clubs, a wide range of social and cultural activities. While most Jewish children were attending Polish state schools by the late 1930s, many were still going to the Chorov and Besyankov schools, sponsored by the religious Aguda, the Tarbut Hebrew schools, sponsored by the Zionists, and the secular Yiddish Chiso schools, sponsored by the Bund and the left labor Zionists. 
Jewish politics in interwar Poland was fractious and intense. Aside from their agreeing that they were Jews, everything else was open to debate. Did Jews belong in the diaspora or Palestine? Was their language Hebrew, Yiddish, or perhaps even Polish? Were they a secular people or a religious community? Should their future be based on socialism or private enterprise? If Zionists dominated Jewish politics in the early years of Polish independence, and if the Orthodox Aguda basked in Polish government support in the years that Pilsudski was in power, the immense, the immediate pre-war period saw the meteoric rise of the Bund. In the Warsaw City Council elections of 1938, the Bund won 38% of the Jewish vote. Its vote in Ludge, uh, 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 it won 62% of the Jewish vote and garnered 18 of the 20 council seats won by Jews. Its vote in Ludge and Vilna was almost as impressive. Did this mean that Polish Jews had suddenly become Marxist? No. As one wag commented, the Jews voted for their Bund on the way to afternoon prayers. But why did the Bund suddenly become so strong? Because its major rivals had all suffered serious setbacks. Britain was cracking down on Jewish immigration to Palestine. New legislation restricting kosher slaughter undercut the claims of the Aguda that its cautious, moderate policy of behind the scenes negotiation was the best way to get the Poles to respect Jewish rights. The purge trials and Stalin's dissolution of the Polish Communist Party cooled the ardor of many young uh, uh, communists. The social structure of Polish Jewry was changing as more and more Jews became proletarianized and joined unions. For Polish Jews, hoping against hope that they had a future in Poland, the Bund was the only Jewish party with the Polish ally, the PPS, the Polish Socialists. So with other options closing, the Bund's defiant message of doikait, hearness, hearness, made more and more sense. Escape, whether to Palestine, to Stalin, or to God, was futile. Our life is here, da, where we've lived for centuries. They want us to leave, screw them. We'll stay and fight for our right to be here as equal citizens. And here's a Bund election poster. Dalton wo mir leben, dort ist unser Land. Where we live, this is our land. While the Bund fought hard for Yiddish culture, there's no denying that Yiddish was on the defensive in interwar Poland. By 1939, 25% of all Jews were speaking Polish as a first language. Most Jewish children were getting their primary education in Polish government schools. Linguistic acculturation especially strong, was especially strong in Galicia, as well as in, among the Jewish middle and professional classes of Congress Poland. But the story of Jewish culture in interwar Poland was hardly a simple zero-sum game where one language triumphed at the expense of the other. As uh, Hanusz Meruk pointed out, Polish Jewry between the wars developed a culture that was polylingual, marked by a rich interplay of Yiddish, Polish, and Hebrew. Even as more and more Jews spoke Polish as their first language, they still flocked to the Yiddish theater and they learned Hebrew. Yiddish speakers avidly devoured Polish literature, whether in the original or in Yiddish translation. In addition, the best-selling Yiddish books were often translations from other literatures. The last thing Polish Jews wanted was to live in a cultural ghetto. The vast majority of Polish-speaking Jews regarded themselves as Jews, not Poles. In the interwar years, they created a new world of quote-unquote Jewish Polishness, to borrow Katrin Stefan's term. The new Polish-language Jewish press became a major pillar of this Jewish Polishness. Dailies like Nash Pszegwon, Novi Genik, and Chvila were especially important. Uh, this Polish-language Jewish press 
developed a specific reading of Jewish Polishness that distinguished between the liberal tolerant core of Polish culture and the rapid xenophobia that was so conspicuous in the Second Polish Republic, or maybe that was wishful thinking. Here is a, a weekly aimed at Jewish women, and the weekly is called Eva. The Polish language Jewish press nurtured the fervent hope that anti-Semitism was a passing of aberration, that Poles would return to their better angels and remember the toler toleration and liberalism of the past. Ongoing acculturation often exacerbated the psychological difficulties of a younger generation that on the one hand was exposed to the glories of Polish culture, but then was simultaneously reminded that this culture was not theirs and that they were unwanted outsiders. And as we can see from YIVO youth autobiographies, one way young Jews responded to their predicament was to join youth movements, Zionist movements like Hashomer, Dror, Betar, Bundes movements like Tsukunft. Unsure of their future, often uneasy at home, often rejected by their non-Jewish peers, young Jews in Poland turned to each other for support and companionship. The youth movements became a truly novel feature of Jewish life in Poland. While some existed before the First World War, it was in the interwar period that they acquired mass appeal. Whether Zionist, Bundist, or communist, youth movements gave their members a home away from home, an, al an, alternate, an alternative family, a nurturing counterculture. Ideology played a major role, but so did literature and theater. The youth movements offered dignity and psychological support. They helped break down long-held prejudices in Jewish society against artisans and manual workers. Zionist youth movements held out the hope, however slim, of emigration to a kibbutz in Palestine. Bundes and communist young people learned about the dignity of work and about a socialist future that would give them opportunities they so sorely lacked in the present. The youth movements inculcated idealism and mutual trust in the face of an uncertain future. By the late 1930s, as anti-Semitism spiked, self-defense, hanging on, waiting for better times, became the top priority of Polish Jewry. And the work of the Joint Distribution Committee, as well as social service organizations that helped fund, like TOS and CENTOS, which dealt with public health and poor children, became more important than ever, as the uh, Vishniak's photographs remind us, photographs to raise money for the JDC. This is a poster of the, uh, of the TOS, uh, a society to further uh, 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 public health among Jews. And here we see a strong, healthy Jew lifting a rather sickly Jew up the stairs to better life and better health. Even as it faced the burden of helping G G German Jewry in the late 1930s, the joint made a major effort to expand its activities in Poland where its expenditures rose from 123,000 in 1933 to 1 1.2 million in, 1930, in 1938. One of the effective ways the joint leveraged its help to Polish Jewry was through the Gamilis Chesed Casas, or the Free Loan Societies. On the eve of the war, the societies, the TKB or the umbrella organization, presided over 900 microcredit societies all over Poland, one in every shtetl, with a membership of close to 100,000. In the shtetl, secular and religious Jews, Marxists and Zionists, put aside their differences to work together in these microcredit societies that lend Jews the money to buy a permit, buy merchandise for the market day. And after a pogrom, the JDC turned up to offer loans. It reminded these beleaguered Jews they were not alone. The JDC also mobilized help from the Landsmannschaften, and remittances from abroad helped many shtetls and individual Jews cope. 
In the years before the war, Polish Jews could take some comfort in the small victories on the economic front. The JDC and local resources helped Jews in Jesh build and recover from the devastating pogrom there. The same was true in Minsk Mazowiecki. Thousands of small time Jews, thanks to the joint, were learning quote unquote secondary occupations whose paltry but real supplementary income made it possible to survive. This determination to wait it out and do whatever was necessary to survive was reflected not just in the uh, Jewish press, uh, <clears throat> but in stories and poems published in the late 1930s. This determination to hang on, you can see in a poem written by Maurizzi Schimmel, a Jewish poet from Lvov, who'd written mostly in Polish, but now in 1939, writing in Yiddish, and I'm coming to the end of my talk now, Schimmel described a Jewish father who was trying to comfort his child after their home had been damaged by hooligans. We must on our own find comfort for you and for me. We must on our own repair the walls, fix the windows. We must on our own put in new doors. Let them threaten us with knives. Let them beat and steal. We'll put in new panes, knock together new tables once, twice, three times, until the last time, the one we're waiting for. We can have patience. We can wait. Some observers saw faint signs of hope. The Polish left did well in the local elections of 1938 and 1939. The Peasant Party, at its last pre-war Congress, excised previous anti-Jewish declarations from its platform. More and more intellectuals began to condemn the vicious anti-Jewish violence in the universities. I conclude, Polish Jewry was a community beset by challenges and difficulties, but few communities in the history of the Jewish people showed more resilience, vitality, and national consciousness than did the Jews of interwar Poland. In the last years of peace, they joined their fellow citizens in an effort to bol bolster Poland's defense. Meanwhile, they educated their children, helped each other, and continued to fight for their rights and national dignity. Even as they saw dark clouds on the horizon, many continued to hope for a better tomorrow. They had no choice. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, very, very much for this really scintillating and uh, beautiful talk uh, and, and a perfect way to open to open our session. Uh, I would invite uh, those with questions uh, to put them in the Q&A. And what I will do is after we finish with our next uh, next speaker, uh, we will uh, have a wrap up Q&A session. So we'll hold off until then. So thank you, Sam. Uh, our next uh, speaker. Um, is going to uh, address the other workshop, uh, geographical workshop uh, that um, Vishniak worked in, not just the geographical workshop, but it was also where he lived, uh, and that is in Germany in the interwar period. Uh, Michael Brenner is the Seymour and Lillian Abinson Chair in Israel Studies and the Director for Israel Studies at the American University. He also holds a chair in Jewish History and Culture at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, and he's uh, he is a ma master of, uh, of, of many fields, but uh, I think the principal one that he's here for today is to speak about his authority as one of the leading scholars of German Jewish history. Uh, he received his uh, PhD from uh, Columbia University uh, back when both of us were there together and much, much younger, um, and has held teaching positions at Indiana University and at Brandeis at Hopkins at Haifa at Zurich, in Vienna and the Europe, uh, European University in Budapest. Uh, he is also the international president of, for the, of the Leo Beck Institute for the study of German Jewish history and culture, and an elected member of the Bavarian Academy of Science and the Academia Nazionale Vigiliana in Italy and the American Academy uh, for Jewish Research. In 2014, he was awarded the Order of Merit from the Federal Republic of Germany. And in 2020, he was the recipient of the first ever Salo Baron and Jeanette Baron Award for Scholarly Excellence in Research of the Jewish Experience. Um, 
his most recent publication actually deals with the period uh, that we're talking about now, the interwar period, uh, and that is uh, entitled Hitler's Munich, Jews, the Revolution and the Rise of Nazism, which just came out with Princeton in 2022. Uh, in Search of Israel, The History of an Idea, also came out with Princeton in 2018. And his previous books include um, uh, A Short History of the Jews from 2010 and a, a classic text, The Renaissance of Jewish Culture in the Weimar Republic, um, that we, I'm sure we're going to hear some some snippets from that from that in his talk today. His works have been translated into over 10 languages and uh, it just gives me great pleasure and a delight to introduce uh, my friend to you, Michael Brenner. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, John. And it is a real pleasure being in the same panel with uh, John Efron and Seb Kasso. Um, I wish we would have a chance to be in the same room as well. Um, so in a way, I think I'm doing something quite similar, as you just heard about uh, Poland from Sam Kasov, and I will kind of try to set the scene uh, for German Jewry, for the uh, Jewish life in Weimar, Germany. And a few years ago, uh, I delivered a lecture, I believe it was in North Carolina or Tennessee, on Weimar, Germany and its golden 20s. And after the lecture, an elderly lady came up to me and she looked a little bit bewildered, bewildered, and she said she enjoyed the lecture tremendously, but she was left with one question. And she asked me, who was Weimar? So as someone who grew up in Germany, the question first surprised me, but then I realized how little Germans know about American history, and maybe I should not be uh, too puzzled about her question. So even though this audience certainly uh, does not need much of an explanation on what Weimar Germany stands for, let me say at the outset that Weimar was, and actually still is, a city in the eastern part of Germany. Uh, it was the home of classical German literature and of modern German democracy. It was in this rather small city uh, where Goethe and Schiller wrote some of their most important literary works in the late 18th and early 19th century. And it was there where the Constitutional Assembly for the first democratic German state after World War I uh, met. And it is uh, this republic, the Weimar Republic, that um, we usually identify with the first period of democracy in Germany, but also the failure of democracy. And we should also not forget that the Weimar Republic only lasted 14 years from November uh, of 1918 to January of 1933. It was then in January of 1933 that the democratically installed chancellor, Adolf Hitler, brought it to a premature and the Weimar Republic, of course, continued to live on in collective memory. And I'm trying to also share my screen. Here you see actually a photograph taken by Vishniak uh, while he lived in Berlin. One second, let me just make this clear. Okay, so the Weimar Republic continued to live on in collective memory, and it became a symbol of a lot of different things. One of them was also its creativity, the so-called golden 20s, and of course, no other city stands for the golden 20s with its um, cabaret scene, even the musical cabaret is often identified with this period. Um, with the innovations, you see the Zeppelin for the, the, um, on the top right, um, which was developed in Weimar, Germany. You see the streetcars and the fast uh, traffic on the streets. Uh, all of those were part of the Golden 20, the li Libertin, and all of the uh, social welfare movements that happened 
at the time, and so on, um, and so on. And um, the Weimar Republic, uh, however, as we know, stood for many other things as well. And when uh, Sam Castle just said about uh, Poland, the best and the worst of all times, of course, that was true for Weimar Germany, uh, if for any period, it was true for that one. Um, you had a period of incredible inflation where a loaf of bread uh, was worth uh, 50 million mark on one day and a half a billion mark uh, the next day. It was money was worth nothing anymore. You had a period of street fights between the radical political parties, especially, of course, communism on the left and the rising national socialism on the right. And you see political slogans all over buildings and in the cities. And of course, you have um, the, the artwork of, um, of somebody like George Gross. Uh, you see his paintings representing the, um, the tensions of the time very well. The Weimar Republic uh, was, in fact, a Berlin Republic, if you want. And it was here in Berlin that Jewish life developed most um, rad rapidly during this period and even before. Berlin was, without any doubt, not only the capital of Weimar Germany, it was also the capital of the Jewish life, of Jewish life in Germany. And um, I, I want to emphasize that this was not always the case. Until the mid 19th century, the vast majority of German Jews lived in rural areas, in villages, in small towns, not Städtlach like in Poland, uh, but they were spread. They were, of course, a much smaller population than in Poland. Um, by the 1920s, there were about 200, sorry, 600,000 Jews in Germany, about 1% of the population. And almost by 1933, almost one third of German Jews lived in the capital in Berlin. The Jewish community of Berlin had about 170,000 members. And when I say the Jewish community had members, that was to be meant literally. That is very different from America, where Jewish communities, uh, in the same sense, in a literal sense, in a political sense, do not exist. There is no institution called the Jewish community of uh, Washington, DC, or of San Francisco. They're just congregations and Jewish associations and uh, ACC and so on. But in, in Berlin, until, in Germany, until today, the Jewish community is an institution which um, is financed by tax money of its members. You notice it by the end of your fiscal year um, that about 8% of your income tax will go to either the church you belong to or the Jewish community in the city. So the Jewish community of Berlin, in a way, was a rather big city, uh, uh, if you would just take 170,000 people, a city within the city, not only with synagogues, like you see here, the new synagogue, which was dedicated in 1866, and was, of course, rededicated um, about uh, 20 years ago, and it stands again, in Berlin, and it's very visible as a symbol of Jewish life even today. Um, it was a city within the city, the Jewish community, that had not only many synagogues and cemeteries, uh, but also Jewish schools and welfare institutions. And by the 1920s, this was actually the largest part of the budget of the Jewish community of Berlin, as in other big cities, how to help the unemployed, how to help the East European Jews, and we'll talk more about them in a minute, who would come into the city, how to help people, middle-class people, which most of the community belonged to, who would suffer 
um, under the inflation and lose their jobs or lose a lot of their income. That was a very important uh, uh, task of the Jewish communities in the 1920s in Germany. And just as we heard from Poland before, um, there were also political parties in the Berlin Jewish community. They had elections about every four years. Again, it's like a small city, or like a rather not so small city, 170,000 people uh, voting for the secular leaders of their Jewish community. And you had uh, liberal Jews, you had Zionists, you had um, Orthodox Jews, but also social democraticists and the uh, more right-wing German nationalist Jews all running for as candidates on their own lists for the Jewish community representatives. Jewish life in Weimar Germany is often depicted as dancing on top of a volcano. And indeed, among the many dancers um, in this big volcano in Germany, maybe the Jews were one very conspicuous group. They danced faster and closer to the abyss than anyone else. And when the volcano erupted, and of course in 1933, they were the first to be swallowed. But no one knew that in 1920 or in 1930. But let us dive right into this cultural world of Weimar Germany. Take, for example, one of the most famous Berlin cabaret songs of the 20s. Oh, unter den Linden, they trop and galop by foot on horse in pairs with a watch on the arm and a hat on the head, and none has time to spare. This song, entitled Heimat Berlin, was presented in Max Reinhardt's famous cabaret, Schall und Rauch, Sound and Smoke. It reflected the life and rhythm in the Prussian metropolis during the so-called Golden Twenties. The show was entitled, was titled Berlin Tempo, but it soon became known as Jewish Haste. And indeed, everyone involved in it happened to be Jewish. Walter Mehring, who wrote the text, Friedrich Hollander, who composed the music, and Paul Gretz, who starred on stage. So this was quite typical of what the image of Jews at the time were. Um, Jewish haste, I think, uh, captured at least the image quite well. And of course, many of those images should, are familiar to you. Some of the Berlin Jews were quite well known and famous, or I shouldn't say Berlin Jews because many of them did not come from Berlin, but they lived in Berlin in the 1920s, such as Albert Einstein, or um, on the top right, Elisabeth Bergner, who was one of the famous actresses of the time. And if you go to the bottom right, Arnold Schoenberg, who was the inventor of the 12 tone music and one of the most famous um, composers of the time, originally from Vienna, but like Einstein, who grew up in Munich, both lived in Berlin in the 20s. And of course, maybe the most famous at the time, Walter Rathenau, whom you see on the left bottom, who was German foreign minister only for a few months in 1922, before he was assassinated by right-wing terrorists. And you can go on and on. The most emblematic of all Berlin novels was Alfred Dublin's Berlin Alexanderplatz, by the way, also depicting East European Jews. The sharpest political satirist was Kurt Tucholsky, who wrote for a journal called Weltbühne, established by Siegfried Jakobson. The most distinctive painter was the Ur-Berliner Max Liebermann, and among Weimar Germany's architects, Erich Mendelssohn was perhaps the most iconic and modernist. Berlin attracted intellectuals from other parts of the German-speaking world. As I mentioned already, the composer Arnold Schoenberg came from Vienna to Berlin. Uh, the writer Leon Feuchtwanger left conservative Munich for progressive Berlin. And even Franz Kafka came from Prague to spend much of his last year, 1923, in Berlin, where he took classes 
at the liberal rabbinical seminary, the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums. Many observers stress the prominence of Jews in Weimar culture. The writer Gottfried Ben, not always a friend of the Republic or the Jews, he self he, he conceded that the overflowing plenty of stimuli, artistic, scientific, commercial improvisations, which placed the Berlin of the 1918 to 33 in the class of Paris, stemmed for the most part of the Jewish sector of the population. But of course, we should not, we should not forget that the vast majority of Berlin Jews, like Jews everywhere else, were not famous. They were shopkeepers, they were had bakery like, like here, they participated in sport like this club, Bar, Bar Kochba Berlin, a picture from the 1920s. And um, this is the city in which Roman Vishniak lived for a pretty large part of his life among uh, those Jews who were not necessarily um, famous in any way. Let me say a few words about their involvement in politics. And I would just repeat again what Sam Kasso said about Poland. Yes, quite a few of the communist and socialist leaders were Jewish, but very few of the Jews were communists. The revolutionary and post-revolutionary turmoil between 1918 and 1920 in Germany placed the Jews for the first time, and that is significant, at the center of violent events, both in Central and East Central Europe and in Germany. Revolutionaries of Jewish background were often identified with the radical left. Anti-Semites were, we shouldn't forget that, were hardly interested in Rosa Luxemburg's rejections of her ties with the Jewish community. And it was to no avail that the Jewish community of Munich distanced itself from the Jewish born leaders of the period of 1918-19, including the short-lived Bavarian Soviet republics, like Moscow-born Eugen Levine, whom you see to the left of Rosa Luxemburg here. In fact, um, just as it did not matter that in Russia, Lev Bronstein had changed his name to Trotsky and cut all of his bonds to Judaism. As the saying went, the Trotskys made the revolutions and the Bronsteins paid the price. They did pay the price for it, and the same was true in Germany. What was noticed in the eyes of the masses was that Jewish leaders, for the very first time in German history, took an active part in ruling German states, both, by the way, for a short time in Bavaria and in Prussia. And among them were quite a few um, of East European descent. Of course, there, were quite, there was quite diversity of East European Jews in Germany at the time. And you can see that just in this picture. Uh, on the, uh, uh, just four, five examples actually of East European Jews living for shorter or longer in Berlin during the Weimar Republic. On the very left, you see a drawing of the two Hebrew writers, David Frischmann and Nachman Chaim Bialik. And it was actually made by uh, the father of the writer, uh, Boris Pasternak, Leonid Pasternak, themselves Russian Jewish refugees in the city. And uh, what you see here is two writers in Berlin in the early 1920s. One of them, Frischmann, 
whom many of us just know because there is a Frischman street in every Israeli city and very few people read him today. Frischman um, lived for decades in Berlin. Actually, I once met his son, many, he's no longer alive, but uh, many, many years ago, he didn't know Hebrew. He, did, he grew up with German. Uh, and his father, like many other Hebrew writers, lived in Berlin. Bialik was only for a very short time in Berlin, but there was a big celebration while he was there in the Berlin Philharmonic to celebrate his 50th birthday. And it's probably not wrong to say that for a short, short time in the early 1920s, Berlin was the capital of Hebrew literature with people like Frischmann, Bialik, Agnon, the young writer Shmuel Yosef Agnon, later Nobel Prize winner, um, lived for many years, not in Berlin, but in other German places, but Homburg near Frankfurt, in Leipzig, and then in Berlin as well. Um, and another example to the right of Bialik and Frischmann is uh, Shimon or Sim, Simon Dubnov. Shimon Dubnov, of course, was another Russian Jew who lived, who moved to Berlin after World War I, disappointed by the communist Bolshevist revolution, where he could not develop his ideas of Jewish autonomy. And in Berlin, he said, he found the quiet time he needed to write and publish. It, in fact, it was there where he published his 10 volume World History of the Jewish People. He was the leading Jewish historian at the time. Uh, he published, he wrote it in Russian, but he published it first in the German translation in Berlin of the 1920s. And these two gentlemen to the right may not look so familiar to you because we usually have pictures of their older years. Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the later Lubavitcher Rebbe. There's even a picture with him without a hat and without any head covering, very disputed. Um, and the uh, Lubavitch Hasidim uh, always, uh, you know, uh, copy a kippah on his head later. Um, it, maybe it was a passport photographer, we don't know. Here he wears a hat. He was a student for a short time in Berlin and he might have met, we don't know, he, lots of stories about it. Um, Chaim Soloveitchik, uh, one of the, sorry, Joseph Soloveitchik, one of the leaders uh, of Orthodox Jewry later, intellectual leaders, and one of the uh, great uh, theologians or writers uh, in, 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 and opponents of Hasidic Judaism. But both of them also uh, were for a while in Berlin um, as were many other uh, secular and religious uh, leaders or later leaders um, of East European background. So that again was the scenery of an East European life in Berlin that uh, was uh, most um, clearly seen in one area, the so-called Scheunenviertel, where East European Jews felt at home. They had come to Berlin already before World War I and to other German cities in order to find refuge from the pogroms in Russia. They didn't make it to America. Maybe they didn't want to leave Europe or they weren't able to. They didn't make it to America or to England or to France. They came to Germany. In fact, my own grandmother uh, and her family came in the late, in the, in the 1890s from Minsk to Dresden, not to Berlin. And as so many others, they were later caught by the Nazis uh, in Germany. What you see here is the Scheunenviertel, is this area where you have Talmud schools, where you have Jewish bookstores, um, where you have all kinds of a Jewish infrastructure, as you had similar quarters, of course, in Vienna and Paris and London. Anti-Semitism was certainly a part of Jewish life in Weimar Germany. But we, again, and I, I repeat what Sam Castle have said before, we cannot see it through the glasses, through what we know happened after 1933. And still, 
Anti-Semitism was clearly on the rise during and right after World War I. And one might ask, how come that the Jews did not leave Germany if anti-Semitism, discrimination, and economic crisis hit them so hard? But the situation is more complex than one might assume at first glance. They often, and now I'm talking about the German Jews, not the East European Jews, the German Jews often lived in places where their roots reach back centuries. In fact, this last year, uh, Germany celebrated 1700 years of Jewish life. It was in the year 321 under the Romans when we possessed the first document of Jewish presence in the city of Cologne. <clears throat> and while economic crisis and anti-Semitism were felt by many, it was also clear to them that they were not the only group under attack. It was not always pleasant to belong to the Protestant minority in Catholic regions or vice versa. Communists and ultranationalists fought each other on the street. And the economic crisis created millions over millions of unemployed. Seen in such a global perspective, Jewish suffering was, even with all of its specific characteristics, part of a generally little uplifting situation for many in the 1920s. Now, of course, some Jews explicitly related to the rising anti-Semitism also in their cultural productions. And I'm going back to Friedrich Hollander. I quoted a verse of his cabaret scene before, um, the one on Jewish haste. In 1931, Hollander set the following text to the melody of Carmen's Day. Whether it rains or it hails, whether it snows or there's lightning, whether one freezes or sweats, whether it's nice or cloudy, whether it thaws or pours, whether it drizzles, whether it trickles, whether you cough or whether you sneeze, for all of this, the Jews are guilty. The Jews are guilty of everything. That was one of his cabaret numbers, uh, in a way, making fun of anti-Semitism on stage. Um, he also made fun in one of his other sketches of Little Hitler in his cabaret production. Of course, a few years later, he wouldn't make fun anymore. Even writers who predicted the rise of anti-Semitism and the expulsion of Jews could not imagine mass murder. One of the sharpest critics of Weimar Germany, the left-wing writer Kurt Tucholsky, envisioned in 1930 how right-wing Jews would accommodate with the Nazi regime. In the last and most biting of his Herbendrina essays about this authority-loving German nationalist Berlin Jew, Tucholsky characterized Herbendrina compromising with a then, of course, still fictitious Nazi dictatorship. He writes this in 1930. Being in a possession of a yellow card, Vendrina is certain of his immunity as a protected citizen, whereas the East European Jews are being expelled. And of course, we know there would be no yellow card issued once the Nazis really came to power. And in fact, there were attempts to expel East European Jews as early as 1920 and 1923, um, most uh, conspicuously, and that's what I what John John Efron just mentioned in the introduction. That was I, what I dealt with in my latest book in Hitler's Munich. Uh, but uh, the Bavarian government, not Hitler's government, a conservative Bavarian government, tried to expel not all East European Jews, um, but a number of them which in the end failed, but it was a very real threat to many East European Jews at the time. And then in 1923, there was a repeated attempt just a few weeks before Hitler's failed beer hall coup or beer hall putsch. And in Berlin too, there were scenes of anti-Semitism in the, in the streets, just like in Munich in 1923. And for the first time, 
we hear a lot of reports that mention the word pogrom, pogrom, in Berlin and in Munich in November of 1923. In fact, for about two hours, well, it was only two hours, but it was two hours of violence where uh, masses uh, of Germans who were uh, incited by the young Nazi party, rushed into the Scheunenviertel, destroyed shops, uh, hit people whom they recognized, identified right or wrong as Jews, and created a lot of damage. And the same we see on November 8th and 9th of 1920, not, not only 1938, November 8th and 9th, same days, in Munich in 1923, when Hitler tries to come to power. And during that night, where he still tries to, um, throw, to, to overthrow the Bavarian government, there are violent acts uh, against socialists and Jews in the city of Munich. But here I'm ending uh, with a photograph by Vishniak in Berlin. But let us not forget, during the 1920s and early 30s, most German Jews did not view themselves as dancing on the top of a volcano. And if so, they were convinced that the volcano was no longer active. During the 1920s, the majority of the 600,000 German Jews, and about 20% of them were from Eastern Europe, the vast majority of them felt at home in the country in which their ancestors had lived for centuries, where they were integrated in sports and cultural associations, and to a rapidly increasing degree, not only befriended, but also intermarried with their non-Jewish neighbors. Obviously, they were not blind to the threats of a violent anti-Semitism that accompanied the often, the often brutal street scenes of the last Weimar years. But they could not imagine that it would turn into official state policy. And who are we to judge when one can actually recognize the moment of no return? When is it too late? When would, should one leave? Some people said it, you know, in this country too, after Trump, after Pittsburgh. Um, when is the time when things get really bad? What about French Jews today? And I think we have to keep this in mind. In 1930 and 32, and very often 33 and 35, many German Jews thought this will go away and it will, times will improve again. So it is this complex situation of, as we heard before, the best of all times, the worst of all times, which makes it so hard to judge from our point of view where German Jews were located, in fact, in 1933 when Hitler came to power. And I think it is Roman Vishniak's photographs during his Berlin time that we can see that we can recognize as an important source for a better understanding of this time and place, both in German and in Jewish history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for this. Um, Sam, Sam is there, good, we can, we can both see you. Um, this, is, this has been a, a really great way to actually begin because it's, uh, it's a superb framing device for a later discussion, more specifically of, of Vishniak. And um, one of the things that becomes apparent from both of your talks is, you know, we tend to think of, uh, you know, two diametrically opposed places, you know, <laughs> the Weimar Republic or, or the Polish Republic in the, inter in, in the interwar period. But I think in listening to you, and perhaps Jewish history does this, these two places have, um, for the Jews, certain things in common. The specificities are very different, but we both see 
to Jewish communities under pressure, both two Jewish communities that are enormously creatively uh, vibrant uh, as well, and under economic pressure as well. So, I mean, I think it's, it's a great way to actually think of these two communities together as opposed to being very, very different. I mean, as if they inhabited two different planets. And one of the themes that comes through with both of you, of course, is this idea, you know, is the Weimar Republic good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? And is the, is the Polish Republic good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? And um, I'm going to do something that I, we hear, uh, those of us in Jewish history here, others do, and I'm going to just give you one little anecdote uh, that I think exemplifies this. Um, uh, my grandfather, my Zayda uh, Sam, was from Shittik uh, and uh, had uh, moved to Radom, uh, which was only about 11 kilometers away, uh, but uh, the pogrom hit Shittik in April uh, of 1936 and sent shockwaves uh, everywhere. Um, in January, late January of that year, and it was after that, they then made the, made the attempts to leave the country and they eventually did. And that's how I end up sounding like I did today because Australia was the only place that would take them in. So, but in late Jan, so the pogrom's in April, but in late January, my, my Buber and Zeta had bought just now a substantial and large dining room suite with, you know, 10 chairs and a big table, et cetera, et cetera. No one who is rushing to leave the country buys furniture, right? On both, you know, straightened circumstances that they're in financially, but they had saved up for it. But it really is furniture is a sign of permanence that you're not going to go anywhere. And yet things change very rapidly when uh, for, for, for my family living in Radom that the, the nearby Pshitic problem, uh, uh, pogrom uh, sort of exemplifies this, this the, the, the whole theme that Ezra Mendelssohn raised and that both of you actually have spoken about here today. And that is that it's both good for the Jews insofar as in this case, buying furniture, bad for the Jews, they have to leave a couple of months later. Um, so, I just want to highlight that and feel free to comment or not comment on that. And we have some questions and I'd like to pose them in the time that we have, uh, that we have here. Um, one question and it can apply to both of you. Uh, someone has asked uh, if there's been uh, any scholarship that you recommend or good scholarship on Jewish youth groups uh, in uh, compared to those sprouting up in many other countries in the early 20th century, such as, you know, the Hitler Youth and the Boy Scouts. So if, uh, would anyone like to, and it's, it is certainly part of the cultural, the, the cultural efflorescence of Jews in both countries, of Jewish communities in both, in both the countries that you talk about, and if you could say something about uh, Jewish youth movements. Yeah, well, there, uh, for, the, for the Jewish youth movements in, in uh, Poland, uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, great scholarship. Unfortunately, not a lot in English yet. Uh, there's uh, Mo there's Moshe uh, uh, Kliegsberg's essay in uh, Yiddish, which was published in 1974. Uh, there's a uh, Mosley's uh, long essay about the reading habits of Jewish youth, probably. The, the 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 two best studies, one in Hebrew by uh, Basak about the Jewish youth movements in interwar Poland, then a absolutely superb study by uh, Kamil Kiek uh, that I think is going to be translated into uh, English. When uh, Kiek's study appears, I think that will be a, uh, a a very very useful book on the Jewish youth movements in Poland. Uh, getting a lot of his information from the uh, YIVO youth autobiographies, which which is an amazing resource. Right. Yeah, I I can add to to the German case. It's kind of the same. I mean, most of the studies I um, remember right offhand are are in German, um, but um, but of course a lot of well, we shouldn't forget, probably most German Jews were parts of German youth movements, but it began to change because of increasing anti-Semitism, even before World War I, certainly after World War I, more, uh, and not only Zionist uh, Jewish youth groups and sports associations were created, 
but also non-Zionist ones were. But still, a lot of German Jews con con were part of the German youth movements, and those who were not anti-Semitic, of course. Um, and and I back to what you said before, uh, John, and and I, you know, we we're all aware of it, but I became more aware of it while I was listening to Sam's talk. Um, there are, I think, increasing similarities between especially urban Jewish life in Poland and Germany. Uh, the big difference, of course, is that um, Yiddish was still the most popular language spoken among Polish Jews, and that was a language, you know, obviously different from the language spoken um, by the Polish people around them. This difference did not exist in Germany, um, with the exception of the small a group of East European immigrants, but of course, German Jews, um, even the most orthodox ones, spoke German. And not only German, they spoke the German dialects of their neighbors, Bavarian and uh, Hessian and, 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 and Sex, whatever, Swabian, whatever it was. Um, so they were, in that respect, culturally, they, they were acculturated, even if they were not assimilated. So that's a big difference. Otherwise, I see a lot of, diff a, a lot of similarities especially in, 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 in these times, uh, which we often neglect when we say, oh, there's like totally different communities. And the East European, and I mean, I, I just uh, wanted to add one thing about the, um, the Hebrew writers, uh, which, which came to my mind. Uh, many of them lived in a place in, in, in Berlin in a neighborhood called Friedenau, and they translated it literally into Hebrew. They called it, uh, I forgot which writer, but one writer called it Neve Shalom, because Au is like Neve in, in German, and Frieden is Shalom. So Frieden now became for them Neve Shalom. And, and, and so they played also with these. Um, and, and it was actually the end of the inflation that ended the, the, that, that, that uh, big presence of Hebrew writers, because during the inflation, it was very cheap to print all kinds of Hebrew and other journals and books uh, once the money for it was came from outside, in this case, uh, often from America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it's also, it's also the case, of course, that um, uh, the interwar period uh, is a period when a small uh, but incredibly influential uh, vanguard of German Jewish intellectuals sort of rediscovers Eastern European Jewry. Uh, they encountered them on the Eastern Front as soldiers um, and then became disenchanted with their own assimilated, acculturated German Jewish bourgeois ex existences and it changed their lives forever in, in very important ways. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. As, as Steve Asheim has shown his book, Brothers and Strangers, which I think also captures it pretty well. Yeah, Sam, is there, is it, I wonder, I've always wanted to know if there's an obverse actually of Steve Asheim's book, which is German Jews looking at East European Jews. Uh, what needs to be written is, of, is, is, is the other story, is the way Eastern European Jews, particularly Polish Jews, view German Jewry. Yeah, I mean that that's an interesting topic and I've uh, <laughs> I've actually thought quite a lot about that. I mean the one one little vector into this has to do with uh, the Yivo where uh, at the Yiddish Scientific Institute which was uh, which was organized in 1925 and had its seat in uh, Vilna uh, it kind of used German Jewry as a foil. Uh, that is, uh, German Jewish scholarship is associated with Wissenschaft des Judentums, which sees the Jewish people uh, as a, 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 in purely religious terms, uh, which mines the past in order to create an apologetics and blah, 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 when in fact, uh, uh, if you look at what uh, the YIVO scholars were were saying about German Jewry, uh, uh, you you really don't find any recognition of the kind of renaissance of Jewish uh, uh, scholarship and Jewish studies that uh, Professor Brenner has uh, written about. Uh, they they didn't give the G German Jews the credit that they deserve for, in fact, uh, 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 developing. 
uh, a, a, a uh, creative uh, Jewish culture. So I, I do think that this Dubnovian legacy of the uh, genuine East European Jews versus the assimilated German Jews was still very, very uh, strong. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'd like to be proven wrong, uh, and hopefully more evidence will surface uh, for the other side, but actually it's a, a great topic. The uh, image of German Jewry in the Polish Jewish press, uh, and not only that, but whether the image of Polish, of German Jewry in the Polish language Jewish press would be different from that in, of the Yiddish press, I suspect that it would be. Yeah. <laughs> can, can me, can, it's one of those mythical projects I've wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just say, I, 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 since you mentioned Dubnov, or something I forgot to mention, forget to mention, um, is that um, he and others uh, who were in Berlin, Elias Cherikov and Nachum Stiff and others, they actually founded the Yivo Institute in Berlin in, in 1925. It moved very fast. I mean, it moved right after that to, to, to Vilna, but, but the actual act uh, of its establishing was done by, with, with, it wasn't just Hebrew, intellectuals, but also the Yiddish speaking intellectuals who were in Berlin. And Dubnov was in Berlin throughout the whole period until 1933. Um, so he actually became, a, I mean, just um, uh, he, just by his, he lent his name even to a party uh, the, the running for the Jewish, I mean, community elections in Berlin. And, and so he, he was present there. And I think very in circles. Mm -hmm. That was the Yiddish Volkspartei. Yeah? That was the famous Yiddish Volkspartei. Yeah, so that actually brings me to, to since you mentioned Yivo in Berlin, um, two of the signatories for that, sort of ratifying that it should, were, were Einstein and Freud, if I, remember, if I remember correctly. So that leads me to a question that someone has asked um, about, uh, can, you, can you speak a little bit about Vienna during this period? <clears throat> And were there similarities between and, and different? What were the similarities and differences between uh, Berlin and, and Vienna? And, and actually, if I may even connect it with another question in the chat, which asked about other Jewish culture and other or Jewish presence in other cities of Germany, yes. because that I'm, I try to tie in. Um, I didn't know you could see that. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I would say um, the, the big difference is Berlin was indeed as I said, almost a third of all Jews of Germany lived in Berlin, but still over two thirds did not live in Berlin. So there were other communities which were pretty strong, um, but not in the same league as Berlin. Berlin had 170,000 Jews. The second largest was Frankfurt, which had close to 30,000, even though Frankfurt is a much smaller city. So percentage wise, it was higher. And then you had cities like Hamburg and Cologne and Breslau who had smaller, Jewish populations between 10 and 20,000. But in Austria, and that's the big difference, Vienna, the vast majority of all Jews in interwar Austria, that small state that Austria had become, the vast majority, over 90%, lived in Vienna. So Vienna, in a way, was Austrian Jewry. Another difference was that the percentage of Jews from Eastern Europe, and now, of course, it's like, well, what do we define as Eastern Europe? Um, uh, but Jews who came from the East um, made a much larger percentage of the, in, in Jews of Vienna, um, because it was until the mid 19th century, the Viennese Jewish community was very tiny, it was very hard to settle there as a Jew. And they didn't also have to immigrate because until the end of World War I, if they came from Galicia, uh, the Austrian uh, Eastern borders, they were still within Austria. Um, and so they didn't have to uh, immigrate and they were Austrians moving to Vienna. Berlin, it was a little different. Sure, there were Jews who came from the Eastern provinces of Prussia, Posen especially, um, but, it was not as strong as it was in Vienna. So Eastern European Jewish life in Vienna was stronger, but when it comes to cabaret, when it comes to the cultural life, 
very similar indeed, I would say, the presence, the Jewish presence in Berlin and Vienna. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, can I, I, can I pose a, a similar question to you? You focused mostly on Warsaw, but I wonder if uh, you can give us, you know, around Poland in 80 seconds, as it were, to paraphrase Jules Verne, and give us a view of some of the other major cities uh, and the characteristics of Jewish life there and if they differed from Warsaw. Oh, yes. I mean, they were like different countries. Uh, Vilna was a strikingly different city. It was the unofficial capital of an unofficial country called Yiddishland. Uh, Warsaw had six times as many Jews as Vilna, but Vilna was the only city in Poland with the, with Yiddish high schools where it was expected that you spoke Yiddish in public, where even the Jewish professional and middle classes used Yiddish, at least in public, even if they may have spoken Russian at uh, home. Yiddish, uh, Vilna had a collective memory. It had a sense of itself. Uh, it instrumentalized the heritage of the Vilna Gon to serve a secular uh to serve a secular purpose. Krakow and Lvov were also great Jewish cities, but there the Jews were mostly uh, Polish speaking. You see here the influence of the old Habsburg Empire, uh, uh, a, a very thriving Jewish culture in the Polish language. Lodz was like Chicago. It was a uh, Augie March country. It was very brash, a big Jewish working class. Uh, it took pride in its uh, ugliness, uh, and it was, uh, again, a mostly Yiddish-speaking uh, community. Uh, so the regional differences were huge, and these cities were all very different from each other. Right. So that it leads me to a question that's just come in. There are quite a few questions now, so I'm going to we we will uh, we'll speed up a little bit. Uh, I'm curious to know more about uh, the Subcarpathians, as Appalachia, uh, who was written on the hinterlands of Munkach. Uh, there's uh, a, a, per, a professor, uh, Professor uh, Jelinek. I, I'm, I'm blanking on uh, on his name. Yeah. And uh, there's a new there's a new book on the Holocaust in Subcarpathia by someone who's a PhD from Clark. Uh, maybe uh, maybe Siegel. I'm 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 not exact. I'm kind of blanking. But uh, there's still not a lot that's been written. There's there's uh, quite a lot more that of work that can be done here. Okay, uh, someone asked. I'd like to ask Professor uh, Kassoff, in small in small towns in Poland, uh, you mentioned the Jews and non-Jews interacted in markets, and they would have done so in shops as well. Uh, how is it that there was not more opposition by Gentiles in these small towns to the violence carried out against their Jewish neighbors? Well, well, that's a that's a good question. I think the the first first of all, it, as in as we see in Bosnia and as we see unfortunately in other places, you can have neighbors living side by side, going into each other's homes, and then there's a trigger, there's a switch that goes on and off, and interethnic violence uh, 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 breaks out. In in Upshitik, there was a switch. Uh, in many other of these towns where pogroms broke out, there was some incident. Uh, I, I do believe, and more recent scholarship is showing, that these pogroms that broke out in the 1930s were more organized and more prepared than we previously tended to uh, believe. Uh, the Jewish press was heavily censored, and so it couldn't really talk about that. My guess is that most peasants did not participate in the pogroms. We do know that in many towns, peasants defied the boycott and continued to uh, patronize Jewish shops. But uh, if it's true that a lot of these pogroms were organized by the right-wing nationalists who became increasingly radicalized in the late 1930s, then we could say that perhaps one reason why peasants did not help Jews was because they may have been intimidated or they simply wanted to keep their heads down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question here. Um, I think it, uh, I'll direct it towards Michael. Uh, some of Roman Vishniak's photographs are part of the photographic collection of the first Jewish museum in Berlin uh, from 33 to 38. Uh, have you researched 
uh, his work for the museum itself. Uh, the person says, I'm writing my MA on this collection and I'm interested in Vishniak's uh, contribution to it. So I think we'll hear more about Vishniak later because I, I think we're, we're not here as Vishniak experts, but others will be. Um, but the question is really a great question because it deals with the Jewish Museum of Berlin and it's almost an epitaph to the amazing cultural history of German Jews. The Museum of Berlin, ironically, opened its doors on January 24th of 1933, literally six days before Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. In a major ceremony, celebrated, the press reported about, of German officials took part in it, January 24th, 1933. Even <clears throat> a few weeks later, Hitler was already chancellor. The Reichstag, the German parliament building, was, in, was burned down. Even then, a Prussian delegation visited this Jewish museum in Berlin and expressed enthusiasm about the art displayed there. I, I don't know if they if they saw Vishniak's photographs or not, but but all of the famous Jewish artists of the time were presented there. So I think that is um, that is uh, that's actually the story. I ended my book on the Jewish Renaissance of Weimar of, of Jewish culture in uh, the Renaissance of Jewish culture in Weimar Germany with the the opening of the Jewish Museum of Berlin. Yeah, I, I just think one more example of this uh, this theme that both of you have approached of uh, not knowing what was coming, and and you know we know what happened, but they didn't, is that uh, one of the large um, and most important shuls in uh, in Munich, uh, I believe, was built by Eastern European Jews and opened in 1932. And architecture is incredibly important because it's not just about art, but it, it, it requires a massive financial investment as well. So this is not just about, you know, uh, uh, you know, art that doesn't cost, whether it's poetry or something like that, but this is, this, this is, this, this is a real expression. You don't build a very large shul. And I'm, sadly, I know that shul from the fact that my father passed away in that year and I was in Munich saying Kaddish at this shul. Um, that uh, if you're opening a shul in 1932, you see a future. Yeah, and and that's even more so than the dining table of your grand. Well, much more so, but, it, but that's it, it true. Made, you don't build. You don't, but there were a few, not many, but a few synagogues still uh, built in the early 30s. I mean, not after 1933, but 31, 30, 31, 32. Right. Now, there are a few other questions here, but they are about um, Vishniak's photos himself. And, and I think uh, that those those uh, questions should be posed to people who are uh, dedicated to speaking about Vishniak himself later in the day. Uh, so I'm not ignoring those questions, but I think it's, uh, uh, you know, both uh, Sam and Michael are not here really to speak about, uh, you know, the nature of Vishniak's photography. Uh, that's not to say that they don't know about it, but I want to give others later in the day a chance uh, to discuss that. Um, we are remarkably, uh, for a Jewish conference, absolutely on time. Uh, so th this has been a wonderful opening session. I do want to say one thing, uh, and which I should have said at the very beginning, so, so forgive me, and that is for those of you who are speaking later in the day, if you are speaking from... Uh, from notes, um, when you turn the pages, the rustling uh, is picked up by the uh, microphone and is is really, really quite loud. Uh, so just be very, very mindful of that, if you don't mind, uh, uh, because it's lots of sort of crackling and rustling. Um, so that's for our, for our speakers later in the day. But for now, um, what I want to do is thank both of you for, uh, for this really exciting and open, opening session. And what happens now is that we take a, uh, a long break for lunch. Uh, we break from 11.30 and we come back uh, at, at 1. Those who are speaking in the next session should log on at 12.30 uh, for a sound check and that sort of thing. But for our guests uh, and the panelists, that will uh, return, we will return at 1 o'clock to continue uh, with our symposium today. So thank you very much for this opening session, Sam and Michael. <laughs>